Hello friends, today we're going to be examining a topic I call the psychology or psychoanalysis of belief. Oftentimes in culture, you know, sort of water cooler conversations, we hear people say things like, well, you know, people are just religious because they're hoping for a community. Or they want to believe that life has some meaning or purpose. Or they're afraid of death, so they're choosing a religious worldview or theism in general because it, if you will, pushes back the terrifying reality of one's mortality. We might say that, well, you know, in the end they want to just believe that there's some justice, that if you will, there's a final reckoning where the evil actually get their just desserts. And because we don't see it in this world, we actually, if you will, push it out into the next life. And this is actually the true reason for one's belief. I believe this tactic to be very detrimental. Because what it does is it takes the place of investigation. It actually stands in for what might have been an inquiry into the reasons for someone's belief. In a sense, even if you are someone who disagrees with religion wholeheartedly, it's actually going to forestall what you would believe is the most important thing, which is the getting that individual or groups and communities to investigate the basis for why they believe what they believe. Psychoanalysis just pushes that duty of inquiry, that exploration, if you will, completely out of the way. I believe one of the ways in which this plays out is it actually prevents us from having to actually investigate a claim, because we can say, well, Whatever it is, whatever belief they have, they don't actually have it for any reasons. Simply, they just wanted meaning or purpose. So they wanted community. So what I, have, what I end up doing is actually distancing myself from an epistemic intellectual investigation of something. And like I said, if I am someone who disagrees with religion, this is what I want that individual to do. I believe this stance, oddly, actually performs the same function of the God of the Gaps argument often touted by creationists. What does this mean? I say, someone asks me why I believe in God, and I say, oh, well, you know, the wonders of the infinity of space. And I plug God in that gap of human knowledge. And when I plug that God into the gap of human knowledge, I can say, well, you know, that's why I believe in God. But what I end up doing is actually opening myself up to an attack if that were explained by science. This is the gap that God is being put in. Often how when it's spoken on it says, well, one of the worst things about this is it actually, if we will, forestalls or even fully prevents an individual from investigating that phenomenon because they've actually used something to plug it. I think this is very much the same in the psychoanalysis of belief. We're actually taking this, well, the only reason they believe that, and we pack in they want community, or you know, they want purpose or meaning. And what this generally does is it forestalls any need to investigate that individual's belief, and to see if they have reasons for what they believe, because we've, if you will, filled the gap with psychoanalysis. The psychoanalysis of the gaps. Because if we didn't, we would actually have to say, okay, well, why do you believe what you believe? What are your reasons behind it? How do you see the world? And in that case, we, even if we disagree in the end, we might learn something about it. And I have to say that in my own experience over the last you know, 25, 30 years of have, having moved in these dialogues, is that this psychoanalysis of belief that is used to explain people's beliefs usually is quite tightly correlated with individuals that know nothing about those traditions. So when I say it acts like a god of the gaps, and in a sense, if you will, plugs the actual duty of inquiry or plugs up true investigation, at least in my own experience, it seems to bear out that people use these, if you will, soundbite responses to religious belief. It actually results in them not knowing much about Buddhism, or Islam, or Christianity, or Judaism, and of course the Baha'i Faith. So I think it's important to stop this psychoanalysis. However, we're going to look at it, and I'm going to, if you will, do the opposite. <laughs> what I mean by this is, Something that is rarely acknowledged within this kind of discourse is psychoanalysis can go both ways. And would an individual take my psychoanalysis of them 
and why they are not religious as actually filling the gap, plugging the gap with psychoanalysis, and then I myself have to ignore their reasons that they believe undergird their own adherence to that belief system. Quickly for a moment, the most common ones you hear are people just want meaning and purpose. Um, they need to believe there's meaning in life. People just want community. They need to belong, or people just want to believe there's justice. And that right will prevail, if you will, in the end. Or people just want to believe they exist after death because they cannot face their own mortality. Now, the issue here was brought home once when I was actually with a co-worker. And I had been reading the Pali Canon, which is a Buddhist scripture at work, and this individual noticed, and we were standing outside later, and he said, uh, you know, oh, so you're, you're religious, you're religious, Rob. And I said, yes, I am, I'm a member of the Baha'i Faith. And he said, oh yeah, I've heard that actually. And he said, well, you know, I'm an atheist, and I actually believe that religious people are religious just because, and he mentioned these, you know, they really just want, you know, community and somewhere to belong, you know, to be part of a, a larger community. And, you know, in some sense, they just, you know, they want to believe that there's some principle of justice out there. And, and they want to believe that there's meaning and purpose in life, and they just can't face their own mortality. And I said, yeah, you know, it's often said this way. At the same time, two can play at the psychoanalysis game. And I said, because, you know, it's interesting because I think people aren't religious. Uh, because they don't want to face the frightening obligations and duties and responsibility if there really is a true meaning and purpose to life that they actually have to go out there, sacrifice their leisure, and investigate it very deeply. And at the same time, they look at the many of these, you know, if you will, religious communities that are actually demanding a certain level of moral action as well. Sometimes they want to take your money. And oftentimes you're rubbing shoulders with people who don't have, if you will, sort of your everyday sort of normal uh, likes and affiliations that you mostly enjoy. As well, it's I said, you know, oftentimes we don't want to think that every action and every if you motivation intention that we have will actually be brought to the fore when we pass away and move on to the next world. And the idea that there will be a reckoning for me is actually not a pleasant situation, or if you will, a, a pleasant idea, because I will be brought to to face all of the things that I did wrong. So often at times, I think people try to avoid the burden of responsibility that actually gets placed on them, because then they actually have to really, really assess their use of time, the behavior they have, the way they treat people. Uh, so I think often people don't want that principle of justice. That goes hand in hand with the idea of actually existing after death. So I said, so people often maybe just really want to do what they want to do. They want to keep to their own, avoid these kind of you know, uh, communities that will actually look at them closely. And they don't really, really, really want to believe that they're held accountable for all that they do. And truly, this individual says, well, yeah, I guess so. That's kind of where I'm at. And I said, exactly. Yeah, what I would say to you is that I don't actually believe that that's the reason why you don't believe. I was just playing a psychoanalysis game. Because I think, and then I went into this issue, that I believe the psychoanalysis of belief prevents us from asking the individual, why are you an atheist? Why did you choose a position to not believe that there is a divine being? How do you see the universe, and what is your reasoning behind it? And this story really calls attention to this issue of both tendencies. And while I do not believe the psychoanalysis of belief to be a necessarily good place to go, it's, it is important to me to recognize that the aversion to these things almost never gets mentioned in popular culture. Whereas religion in itself recognizes both tendencies. All the dispensations and revelations that I myself study seem to recognize that there is both tendencies when it comes to the concept, for example, of being judged. We want to believe that there is actually justice in the universe. Yet at the same time, we sort of, you know, tremble at the idea of ourselves being the subject of it. 
we, the, I believe all traditions recognize both tendencies when it comes to community, that there is a desire to have these communities, but also a desire to remove ourselves from and be distant from it. And it's important to me to point out these issues because not because I think they should stand in the place of an investigation of a person's reasons, but rather because it is actually within religious communities that both tendencies are recognized. Both psychological, if you will, predilections are brought to the fore, and discussed, in fact. So when we come to the issue of seeking meaning and purpose, it's important to recognize that all religions recognize this tendency, and if you will, predict it. <laughs> Why? Because from a religious perspective, where we are created in the image of God, or we have our true Buddha nature, or we ourselves are, if you will, a reflection of Brahman in Hinduism, that in essence there is a fundamental purpose to our life that we are meant in our investigative quest to find and then strive throughout our life to adhere to it and become more and more congruent. So from a religious perspective, and any of the ones I know, there is an immediate recognition that there would be a psychological, if you will, longing or yearning or tendency to actually try to find this, to want to find it. At the same time, we recognize that there is this issue regarding our aversion to it. Because I will be honest, it is actually a frightening notion to believe that there is a teleology, a final purpose to which I am actually created, for, towards which I am created, that I actually have to find, uncover, and fulfill within my life. I think it's important that when it comes to the psychology of meaning and purpose, that even atheists actually recognize this, that there is a longing or an innate desire for us to find it, and they say, well, what you should do is actually recognize this and channel it in other ways. There really is this part of humankind. Um, but once again, it's actually fully within the religious worldview that you would have this. The other issue is, um, put simply, so what? <laughs> it's important to recognize that if I actually have a tendency, if I actually have a drive, if you will, to explain some facet of the cosmos, say within physics or biology or chemistry, and I have a longing and desire to actually, just for some reason, some inherent desire to understand some facet of the universe, and then I do understand it, that doesn't mean it's false. This is again why the psychoanalysis of belief is not all that beneficial of a route to go, because I might have desired, for example, um, Darwinian evolution to be true, a cliché in the history of science, is a natural, uh, that natural selection was working so that the fittest survive in order to justify my own, say, case as someone just pushing forward within the Industrial Revolution. Does that mean that Darwinian theory, which I have accepted, obviously for the wrong reasons, I just wanted it to be true, is false because there was a psychological push and a sociological push so that I could see myself as the fittest, as the better, as the highest pinnacle of evolution? These aren't related. It actually is, if you will, not tied to the truth. As well, simply because I desire to actually find an explanation or understand something does not mean that the thing that I explain or understand is itself false. They are actually disengaged from the actual truth claim itself. There's another facet of this is peculiar because often it's said people choose these belief systems, say for, for example, because it gives their life meaning and purpose. But with that word choose, the belief systems, or are this belief system, it cannot be choose because I cannot say that I am actively, consciously knowing something is false, then grabbing it for the purpose of filling my life with meaning and purpose, and I actually know that it's not true and it's false. So obviously this is not even just a psychoanalysis or a psychological theory in the sense of this is the motivation, it's an unconscious motivation, a subconscious motivation. So in this sense, it's actually in, in a weird way sort of below the level of examination even. I did not choose to be, for example, a Baha'i or a theist because I actually wanted it to be true. 
not in the way that it's often presented, because I can't consciously go, okay, well, I want it to be true, therefore I'm going to say it's true, and then actually believe myself. It's a rather odd perspective, if you will, of the psychology of belief. But again, we come to the end, which is this issue of the aversion. And the idea of there being an overriding purpose and meaning to life, one for which I will be held accountable unto, is not really all that comfortable of an idea. Why? Because it means that when I actually move forward along the plane of my own life history, I actually have to be gauging and weighing my uses of time, the way I relate to people, how I interact with things of an epistemic nature. It's very difficult because it also has, for myself, imposed upon me the use of large amounts of my time to try to serve on my own path of service. And this is far more difficult than doing whatever I wanted. In a sense, it'd be like, yes, of course there's actually a beauty to go to the gym, to actually exercise or learn a craft, but it's important to recognize that there's a great deal of sacrifice and hardships that go along with this. I love Baha'u'llah and recognize him as the manifestation of God for our day. At the same time, I have to be honest that most of the difficulties that I have in my life, if you will, the pressures and the challenges that I face, are actually because I have recognized Baha'u'llah as such and because I am a member of the Baha'i Faith. I have to look at my life from a framework of meaning and purpose, which in some sense frees me up to do things like service or investigation to the world's religions and philosophy and science. It opens up certain ways of behaving that are profoundly beautiful, yet at the same time these are genuine restrictions upon other ways of being that seem to be much more tantalizing and immediate. So a life of purpose is not something that is necessarily all it's cracked up to be. I've heard it once put very simply, and I used to put it in, a, in this way very often, is that there is such a thing as an enviable life, and there is such a thing as an admirable life. I was speaking with my two children about this yesterday. When I look, for example, at the life of Jesus Christ, or someone like Mahatma Gandhi, or I don't know, someone like Abraham Lincoln, and I look at their life, there might be many, many admirable qualities. If I say, look at a Mother Teresa, choose your own individuals. And you examine them, you see how much you admire, say, their fortitude, their perseverance, their willingness to sacrifice, their, their ability to just keep pushing through obstacle after obstacle to rise up and serve humankind as best they can, that's admirable. At the same time, when you look at their lives from the perspective of envy, would it have been pleasant to lead the life of a Mother Teresa? Would it have been pleasant to lead the life of an Abraham Lincoln or a Jesus Christ or a Buddha or one of the great disciples of Jesus Christ or the Buddha? When we look at the early lives of the Babis, the followers of the Bab or the Prophet founders of the Baha'i Faith, or we look at Baha'is in the early Baha'i history or even Baha'is today, is it an enviable position? No. Is it admirable? Yes. But is it something I really want to take up on a Sunday afternoon to hang out? No. It might give one an admirable life, but it is not very enviable. This is the two tendencies. Now when we turn to a desire for community. Simply, religion recognizes this tendency. Uh, paraphrasing a quote from Baha'u'llah, he says, You have been created to carry forward an ever-advancing civilization. There is this notion within every revel revelation, religion, or dispensation that I know of, that there is this, again, this meaning and purpose, which includes the binding together in the body of Christ, the Church, or the Sangha, the Buddhist community, or in engaging with others within the Hindu community, or the Baha'i community, or the Islamic community, being part of the Ummah. 
this is in there, this tendency to, as, a, as a desire to work together with our fellow men and fellow women in commun intentional communities of a spiritual nature, so that we can join together and carry forward an ever-advancing civilization. So this is itself predicted by religion. But there also is the aversion. Um, simply put, Every religion deals with and predicts the existence of a tendency to want to remove oneself from the religious community and spend your time merely as you desire, as opposed to placing yourself within that, if you will, sacred community, that sacred intentional community. And I think every religion, if we actually look at it, deals with the challenge, especially in this day, of both those tendencies. Individuals who say, believe in Jesus Christ, but I've met dozens and dozens and dozens of these who will say, well, I don't have to be part of a church. I don't have to engage myself in the community of Christians. Even though it seems, I, will argue, I would argue, that the New Testament is very clear about bringing together communities, bringing together churches that are organized. I have met Muslims myself who would state that they actually believe in the Prophet Muhammad as a messenger of God, but I don't want to have to deal with that, the whole issue of like, you know, going to mosque and, 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 and serving the community and being part of the community. I just, it's not what I like to do. Uh, given I lived in the Middle East, there are quite a few of these who would tell me this and we're still going to mosque. So I think if you went through Buddhism, Hindu, Hinduism, Christianity, Islam, Shintoism, Confucianism, and Taoism, any of them, you will find those that actually do actually recognize, truly recognize, in some sense, the actual truth of that message or the truth of that founder, yet are pulling away from the community because, to be frank, it can be very hard. It takes time, sacrifice, and often can be very, very difficult. I myself, as a member of the Baha'i Faith, when I walk into a room of Baha'is. There is not immediately, outside of the religious dimension, commonality between our likes and our tendencies, our propensities, the way we actually like to spend our time. And this brings, if you will, the, if you will, there's a better bang for your buck principle. If an individual wants community, moving into a community that focuses on the sacred, and actually on moral rectitude and rectification, there might be a far, far, far better way to find ways to connect with people and relate to people. You could, for example, join an archery club, go to a martial arts club. You could join a book club or a gardening club. You could engage yourself in soccer or hockey or racquetball to join a golf course. Uh, explore the permaculture world, it, it, it move into Comic-Con, get into the gaming world. There's actually, if you will, especially in our day, thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of ways you can find community that doesn't have to bring you for, forward to face the question, if you will, of meaning and purpose and moral rectification and service. There are so many ways that someone can actually find community, and oftentimes when we meet those who, even though believing in a, if you will, manifestation of God, like Christ or Prophet Muhammad or Buddha or Baha'u'llah, who actually remove themselves to the community, they actually move, remove themselves from the community to go to things like martial arts classes and archery classes and book clubs and gardening clubs. <laughs> so there really can be a better bang for your buck. Thus, I don't know how much or how often the psychological desire, as opposed to the psychological aversion, is at work here. Yet once again, I don't believe it is, if you will, the most fruitful line of investigation anyway. One of the pieces of evidence that goes against this you know, commonly stated desire for community uh, is actually history. Why? <laughs> at the birth of Christianity, a Jewish individual would have been moving, sorry, would have been moving from their community, a comfortable, pleasant community of the Jewish people, to a place where they would be ostracized, ignored, and even persecuted. 
So if individuals were driven by a desire for community, they would have just stayed as Jewish individuals. The same goes, for example, for those who accepted the message of Islam. Whether they were from a regional Jewish community, a regional Christian community, or if you will, a polytheist community in Mecca, the most comfortable and pleasant thing would actually be to stay in the polytheistic Jewish or Christian community. If you became a Buddhist, it would have been far easier and far more comfortable for you to even choose the life purpose you had, which was, for example, being a Brahmin, a member of the priestly caste of Hinduism, to move out of that position of power and status and enter the Buddhist community as a lesser, and then be ostracized and looked at unfavorably from those of the community you were in before. Especially at these points, these liminal points within history, what we find is, is actually, yes, you might be, uh, if you will, accepted by the Christian community, but that Christian community is a shocking minority, in, whereas the Jewish community itself was far larger. The same might go, for example, for Cornelius, one of the Roman centurions that we find in the book of Acts. That individual is moving from a position of power, a position where he has great status, and he himself is, if you will, rubbing shoulders in the likes and cultures of the Roman, if you will, religious community. In this case, potentially the Mithraic cult. Now he moves from being accepted and esteemed to going into a rather bizarre community that isn't even of his ethnic origin at that time being a Jewish community of followers of Jesus Christ. But this can actually go all the way through. We actually have individuals who are Buddhists who become Muslim, Muslim who become Buddhist. We have secularists that become Christian and Christian that become secularists. So it seems to really, 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 if you will, make mincemeat of the issue of people are religious just because they desire community. And even the issue, if you will, related to the desire for purpose and meaning. Because if it's just a purpose and meaning, then an individual who is a Jew in the Jewish community has the community comfort and the purpose and meaning, and then actually jumps to become a Muslim. They move from meaning to meaning to purpose to purpose, and they've actually ostracized themselves from the community, and you can do all the permutations yourself on this front. I myself becoming a member of the Baha'i Faith, this was actually not an easy transition. I was highly misunderstood by people close to me and often heard things like, oh, you're just looking for meaning and purpose, but I had a purpose beforehand. I had things that I believed I was meant to do. And I actually lost a great deal of my community when I transitioned from being a secularist to being a Baha'i. So it really does make a great deal of difficult for sorry a great deal of difficulty for this, if you will, psychoanalytic hypothesis. The next principle is the desire for justice. Now, once again, does a religious worldview predict and expect that there will be innately within a human being? the belief and desire for the belief and the recognition that there is a fundamental principle of justice at work within the universe. Of course it is. All religions propose a teleological worldview, that there is some end and purpose to which we are created. Every religion that I know of, or probably ever will know of, proposes the existence of an axiological universe, a universe that is filled with concepts of the good and the beautiful, and of moral realism and virtue. So is there an innate moral nature to humankind that desires justice? Yes, predicted. As well, there is another tendency that is constantly recognized within every faith tradition I know of. The aversion to the principle of justice and mercy. <laughs> this aversion to the very idea of moral realism. I think here it's important to just look at our own lives. Early on in life, we learn to dislike the disapproving stare of another individual. It starts with our parents. We find great discomfort in having 
the knowledge that another human being or human beings actually look at us as having a lowly nature or disapproving of our choices or disapproving of our beliefs. It is undeniable that when we do wrong, we often hope to escape with that wrong undetected because we would prefer to have it remain hidden because of the shocking discomfort of having our own shortcomings seen. So this is an important, if you will, all over evidence or ubiquitous evidence of our aversion to the principles of justice. I've often said to individuals that it would be interesting to perform a social experiment. And I will be honest, I actually have performed this social experiment in many different cases. And the social experiment goes like this. Take your calendar and give yourself, say, three to six months. And choose two groups of 15 days in the next, say, three to six months. And on 15 of those days, say, walk into, I don't know, a group of your friends or people at work, uh, someone at a bus stop, anywhere really, and try diverse, if you will, social situations. And on 15 of those days, when you do this, I want you to make sort of an off-color joke. Or if you're, a, if you're a woman, speak negatively of men. If you're a man, sort of like you know, make some disparaging remark about women. Make, you know, talk about how you're, you know, upset with your wife or upset with your husband. Again, you know, say how we shouldn't, for example, say how we shouldn't be sending money to people who need it because that's their own problem. In some sense, speak pessimistically and negatively on those 15 days. Talk about how you're really attracted to someone who isn't your spouse or you're considering infidelity or just make some very sexual remark about some woman to another man or some man to another woman. You get the drift. <laughs> On the other 15 days, walk into other social situations and start talking about justice and fidelity and the need for us to sacrifice our all for the betterment of humankind. Talk about deep compassion. Talk about there being an underlying purpose and meaning to life and that we will all be called to account at the end of our days for all of the things that we have done. Talk about how we should really, really look at our time and ask, are we truly taking our time and directing it towards what is what we really believe is the good, the true, and the beautiful? On each of these 15 days, please try to pay close attention to how uncomfortable the person is in front of you. See which would actually clear a room faster. And I think you begin to be able to draw out some of the psychological tendencies, some of the aversions that can exist. I will be honest that very often, almost universally, <laughs> those which cause the most discomfort are, if you will, the 15 bright and beautiful days. Those about justice, about fidelity, about the nobility of women, Right? About the nobility of all races and about a life of purpose and meaning that we are held accountable for. Please take the time to actually perform this just once in your life to see what I mean. How it relates here again is this issue. Divine justice, the concept that we will be held accountable for and are beholden unto all the actions that we perform and the thoughts and feelings that we have towards other elicits awkwardness, aversion, and an even times fear. And just speaking as an individual psyche, I have to recognize that that is often how my own psyche reacts when contemplating such realities. Before moving on, once again, please recognize that I do not believe <laughs> that the psychoanalysis of belief leads us into a deeper understanding of reasons, I think it's simply important to recognize that there are two tendencies. And in the end, if someone tells you, well, I didn't go into religion for just a fine purpose of meaning or community or because I believe there needs to be justice, in the end, just believe them and ask them what their reasons are for believing what they believe. We now come to the question 
of the belief in one's existence after death, life after death. It's important to realize that once again religion would predict this conception, this yearning. Because from every religious perspective that I know of, there is enshrined in us some fundamental cosmic nature that, if you will, reflects the moral and epistemic laws of the universe. That we ourselves are not limited to our physical frame, and will continue to exist after the dissolution of the elements that make up our physical body, just as, if you will, the belief or ideas of Darwinian theory continue to exist after the dissolution of a book. Now, when someone sees this within their own self, the strong desire to actually be connected with a recognition of their own reality would ensue because they want to be cognitively sorry because they don't want to be cognitively dissonant they want to have a perspective of what they are congruent in their mind with the reality of their own nature i would have to say that the issue regarding the psychoanalysis of belief regarding the mortality is much more solid why? Because death really, genuinely is frightening. Um, the idea of non-existence on the horizon of one's existence, for sure, is actually something that might be very difficult for some people to grapple with. I actually don't agree with you know, several notions that have been put forward in the atheist camp, where I've seen an atheist be asked, aren't you afraid of dying? And they'll say, well, I'm not afraid of dying. I'm not afraid of, say, the year 1846. When I didn't exist, I didn't exist then, and I won't exist after my, I die, therefore I'm not afraid of it. I don't think this actually really makes sense, because if I was very, very poor at one time and had no money whatsoever, and I have some money now, I can be extremely afraid of actually losing all that money. No, in the case of existence of mortality, once I'm dead, I'm not going to be afraid, because I won't actually be conscious. But the idea of the only existence I'm ever going to have coming to end would naturally be frightening. I've also heard it said that if someone truly believed in life after death, they would not actually be weeping in deep sorrow at actually the death of a friend or a family member. I think this too is actually quite silly, <laughs> uh, if we just really consider human psychology. I myself lived in South Korea with my wife, and my two friends, Jamin and Suyen, lived just down the street from us. We had actually spent so much time together before that had actually spent a year in South Korea together. Suddenly they were going home, and my wife and I, after leaving Korea, were going to be moving to the Middle East to teach English there. And I didn't know how long it would be again before I saw my friends Jamin and Suyen. And when finally Jamin said goodbye to me, and Suyin said goodbye to me, I started crying. I didn't start crying because I thought I would never ever see Jamin or Suyin again. It was simply a farewell. A saying goodbye for a time when I wouldn't, didn't really, really know the next time I would see them. So it is perfectly natural both to weep when someone dies and also to actually have, if you will, trepidation surrounding one's own death even if you believe you're going to exist beyond. Some of the problems with the position regarding someone's religious adherence because of a belief after, of life after death um, runs into first the Hades problem. In the Greek religion, and in many religions actually throughout the ancient world, the idea of what happened after someone dies was actually not a pleasant vision. There's actually a famous uh, part in the Odyssey where actually uh, Achilles is actually spoken to. And he actually says, um, the life of a slave is better than the death of a hero. Why? Because someone even like Achilles, in that, if you will, Homeric view, is actually living in a sort of semi-real wraith-like existence. And they actually don't believe that after death they are, if you will, that cliché caricature, if you will, of you know sitting on clouds and playing the harp and everything is wonderful. They actually believe that once someone died, that that was actually not a pleasant place really at all, but more like a ghost-like semi-existence. 
This goes for the case in certain representations in Near Eastern mythology. There isn't this notion of this wonderful place where everything is made right. No, a person is actually subject to fate, and that is all. Do I believe in this? No. The point here is simply that a lot of people did, and they were religious. So that, if you will, psychoanalysis of belief can't really be applied and explain this concept. Because actually the idea of it after life, uh, the idea of having a wonderful experience after life is was the opposite. We also have notions, for example, like uh, Sheol. You did actually have certain Jewish groups that actually believe you didn't exist after your death. You have in the Sumerian religion where you live in this sort of hellish, windswept, sort of dark, dusty place where you just eat sand. <laughs> this isn't something that someone would choose to believe because it offered this wonderful picture of how life is going to be after their death. It just doesn't work out. Um, an additional problem. In the West, uh, we often see the idea of reincarnation as a really neat idea. In the Western world, we see this idea of the continued existence of life after death is actually just one of the sweetest ideas because you know you get to come back and do it again. You get to try over and over and over again to actually you know do better and experience new things. Um, it is really important, and this is often said when people you know study samsara, the doctrine of birth and rebirth, say in Hinduism, Buddhism, that that is actually what everyone's trying to get away from within the Buddhist and Hindu tradition. It is not seen as this wonderful experience where the person continues to have new wonderful life experiences. No, it's actually seen as almost like a hamster wheel that an individual cannot get off of. It is very hard to get off of and they're constantly subjected to, if you will, pain, sickness, suffering, old age and death. Even in the wonderful realms, for example, being a member of the retinue of Brahma, a god in Hinduism represented in the Buddhist if you will, in the Buddhist text, this is actually not a pleasant idea because you can still be completely deluded and you are still subject to a fall. The idea, if you will, of life after death is not necessarily a positive notion. We have here on Bridging Beliefs a, I believe, six-part study of life after death in the Baha'i perspective. And I invariably actually have two conceptions. Um, two, if you will, reactions to that view. I believe, in, if we look at the Baha'i writings, that it recognizes both the existence of a heaven and hell as states of being, but at the same time recognizes, if you will, a upward symbolic reincarnation, where we constantly put on new bodies and actually move throughout the realms of God, which are infinite in, infinite in range and countless in number. Uh, some individuals, when they first hear this, they think, wow, that's absolutely wonderful. I'm going to get to journey and journey and journey, and I never, you know, it, I, it never ends. Whereas almost every time I've actually presented it, someone comes up and says, that's horrible. Why? Because they thought that once they, if you will, got the golden ring, that it's just over. That they can just rest in peace, if you will. Whereas the Baha'i perspective is not... Uh, from certain vantage points, not that pleasant of a picture. Why? Because first of all, you actually are brought forward in a reckoning. This concept of purpose and meaning in life is actually brought to the forefront of your consciousness, and you are judged according to it. Then, subsequent to that judgment, which will be, I know for myself, very uncomfortable, I then actually have to find the manifestation of God in that world, discover Him again like a quest, to find the Beloved, and then actually have to once again try to communicate to other individuals the truth of spiritual reality, and many of them actually won't believe me, many of them might not lock that I'm doing it, and I might make a mistake. That then continues on and on and on and on. And the heart can actually become wearied from this picture, because there is so much obligation and so much duty and so much that I am actually beholden to as an individual. So. This long babble is basically trying to say there are various perspectives of the afterlife, including Sheol, uh, Hades, the Sumerian religion, pictures that we find within Egyptian mythology, all the way across our world that are actually not all that pleasant, and often incorporate things of 
intense judgment, being held accountable for all your deeds, that can actually create a great deal of aversion to the idea of one continuing to exist after their death. At the same time, I don't believe the psychoanalysis of belief <laughs> is the best path. It is simply that I could take someone who doesn't believe in the afterlife and give a really, really uh, long and intricate tale about why they don't believe it for psychological reasons. If I actually look at the desire for community, I can look at the aversion to community. What, how I don't want to walk into a room with a whole bunch of people I know who have different likes and different professions and different economic status just because I believe in the same messenger of God. At the same time, when it comes to the principles of justice, yes, I might want to believe that everything works out in the end. At the same time, the concept of justice lays upon me and forces me to consider the first point, which is my own dedication to a purposeful and meaningful life. Because when it comes to this issue of the enviable life, you know, doing what I want, having a nice vacation, making lots of money, doing whatever pleases me. And this other concept of an admirable life, one of sacrifice and perseverance, and if you will, separation from the immediate desires of the flesh in this world, and choosing a life that is very, 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 very difficult, and not very en enviable, but is admirable, these two pushes and pulls, they can draw me either way. So in each case, we actually have both tendencies, both of which are recognized by religion. And this brings us, if you will, to the difference between the close, if you will, uh, the siren calls close by, as opposed to the distant prizes we cannot see. What do I mean by this? Yes, there are these two aspects. This desire for the enviable life, and this desire for the admirable life. And the admirable life, undeniably, has facets of it which are really about us being held accountable, fighting for a moral realism, a real true principle of justice, actually sacrificing our own desires and likes for the sake of community, and putting our hopes found in every religion and our aspirations to the fruits far off. And those fruits themselves being quite subtle, meaning purpose, virtue, and community. Whereas the siren call very nearby has really, really to do with, if you will, the immediate pulls and desires and fruits of an enviable life in this very day here. Things like justice and mercy and compassion, often individuals don't believe they're even real because you can't see or smell or taste or touch them. Purpose and meaning is denied because we don't have physical, tangible, empirical evidence in the sense of physical that it actually exists. Moral realism is often denied because it is something that I can't lick or smell or poke. <laughs> Whereas, not to be cheesy, but I can taste a Slurpee. I can actually taste, if you will, a burger. I can actually enjoy the fruits of wealth and ease immediately right here and now, and they are extremely sensual and extremely tangible. Those are intangible and distant. These are tangible and close. The enviable life, I think honestly by definition, just has a far greater pull and is like a siren call. That which summons us to actually draw near. So whenever we look at the psychology of belief, I think it's important to realize that there are both of these, if you will, pulls. One more intangible than the other, and at the same time, if I take this as the simple explanation of what someone else believes and why they believe it, I will not, in the end, take the time to truly understand what they believe and the reasons behind their belief. I will use psychoanalysis and psychological explanations as a gap filler, like the god of the gaps, where I have to look no further and simply plug in, they just want community. They just want purpose. They just want justice. They just want to believe they live after death. And at the same time, from the religious or theistic perspective, I can actually say, oh, they just don't want to sacrifice for community. They just don't want to believe that to be held accountable for their deeds. They're frightened of actually meaning and purpose. And they don't want to believe that 
after their death, they will continue to exist and be held accountable, and even after toil and sacrifice, along that path of meaning and purpose. In each case, I can actually just plug up the investigative process for the reasons that that individual usually would just generally, generally tell me themselves. So I suggest that when it comes to the psychoanalysis belief, given two can play that game, we just put it aside as an explanatory model. Thank you very much.